That's right. Okay. I mean, what we're trying to do is draw a pretty fine legal line on what information would be placed on a petition before the signer is presented to the, to the person to sign. And the idea was that information that is specifically tied to that voter um, be supplied um, by the voter uh, in conjunction with the circulator, and that it not be something that is pre-printed, pre-populated, whatever. But there was a recognition um, that with a lot of election-related petitions in the past, you know, the year of signing was pre-populated because people would forget to put 2012. Mm -hmm. 2012 isn't here yet, but 2010, 28 uh, on that. Um, or, you know, people like Senator Taylor's a senator, uh, Risser's district, they would pre-print Madison because mm -hmm. that would be their municipality of residence and uh, it facilitated the process. Even though you're not going to have a rule on this or a, a, a policy, is there anything in state law that would bar someone from pre-populating uh, an address field? Well, bear in mind what we were doing is responding to an inquiry where someone wanted to do a massive pre-population. Mm -hmm. You know, so we were you know, essentially giving ad hoc advice and the response we got from the committee was, if you're going to go this far, we think you're setting a policy. Mm -hmm. um, can can people provide their own data and then have the form print out their own data and not have it be pre-provided, but have it be printed and digitally? Well, I think that's part of the concern here. Most In most cases, the data has been provided by the voter, but there's no assurance that it has been. Um, you know, we know that there are databases with hundreds of thousands of names out there. Uh, some of them are from the gathering of signatures, you know, fill, people filling out a form saying, please let me know when you're going to get the big recall going, yep. you know, and they've got that data. Uh, and I think the sense was it was difficult to draw a distinction between that and someone who would just buy our voter list and pre-populate that and send it out saying, if you're interested in the recall, you know, sign and send in. And, you know, the message that you know, we heard in this discussion was um, that the, gap, the, the petition process has to be a human-driven process. Petitions um, were originally going to be circulated, or could have been circulated in early November. Is this effectively kill any type of new petition being circulated for recall elections? I, this has no impact on that as I see it. I mean, the first day that you could um, bring in you could register with our office for someone who was elected at the November uh, 2010 election um, is November 4th of uh, this year. That would be 60 days from the time they took office uh, that they would be able to start circulating papers. Right, so these papers, but I mean any kind of new petition like this is not going to be out November 4th, obviously, well, right? Well, um, you know, any petition that people use, will, we assume that they would follow our standard petition form, and I think, you know, the, the individual who made the inquiry, you know, we will advise them that this is still in a state of flux. Uh, you know, we responded uh, to your inquiry in September, but since then the legislature has weighed in and they've asked us to, to, to look at this. The board's going to look at it on the 9th, so don't go forward on November 4th. Now, that's an arbitrary date for whoever wants to start. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of political calculations that go into when to circulate a recall petition, and that's, you know, that's out of our bailiwick. We can only tell them this is the earliest stage you can do it. Uh, and, you know, if they start circulating, they only have, if they start on the 4th, they only have one day to file, and that is January 3rd, 2012. They can't file it earlier, they can't file it later. What is the uh, date that this could be done then? And, uh, have this issue resolved, I guess, with these new petitions? Well, I, I think that the issue will be resolved. I'm hoping the issue will be resolved on November 9th, but it doesn't really impact uh, someone who wants to start on November 4th. They just shouldn't be you know, relying on the initial advice that they got from us uh, in September. I think they're beyond notice that, that's, uh, that they do that at their own peril. Your memo says that your your suggestion is that you're going to say to the board, we're going to interpret existing state law and ex existing administrative rules to say that you cannot pre-populate. Am I reading that right? Um, I'm, we'd say we would apply state law right. to, pro to prohibit that, yes. Existing state law. Existing state so law. it's your contention that existing state law bars this. I think you can make that case. And that's, that's the, like I said, this is a fine legal distinction. Where do you draw the line between the year of circulation, the municipality uh, where people vote, 
uh, or things that are uniquely tied to that voter. People would be able to uh, provide a petition that just has one uh, name on it, correct? Uh, they can do that. They do that now. Okay. And that petition doesn't have to meet the exact standards of your, uh, the forms that you put out. I mean, it has to, it doesn't have to be the form that you present. They can. It has to have has the to information, have information that's, information. The information that's okay. required by statute. So if someone submits to the board a petition in that manner and everything is typed except for the signature, how will you know whether it was pre-populated or whether um, the, the person who signed the petition typed it themselves? We wouldn't know that any differently than we would some other uh, where you know someone signs another individual's name. We rely on the challenge process where someone files uh, with evidence to that effect. And so if you do get, uh, you know, this uh, United Wisconsin has almost 200,000 names. If they were to submit 200,000 signatures that had been pre-populated, would you reject them? I think we'd have to look at what was presented to us to decide. Changing your advice here, the, the memo that you put out said, you know, based on what the legislature asked you to do, you went back and sort of looked at this again, and your recommendation would be this. Obviously, there are people here accusing you of sort of backing down. How do you feel? Uh, I mean, have you ever sort of let legislative concern like this influence what the board would issue as recommendations before? I, I think people who make that statement don't understand the process. Uh, any legislative policy making is a give and take. Uh, and as I said, you know, even how you administer the policies, you know, it's not unusual for any agency to have to explain the procedures. I think one of the points, if, if, if you think about what the issues were discussed a week ago compared, you know, they're much narrower for today than they were at the last meeting. And I think, you know, the committee understood a lot of our concerns, understood how we were coming to this. Um, you know, this wasn't a case of someone saying, don't do this. Uh, or else. This was a case of here are the concerns we have from a policy standpoint, how it applies to the law. And we said, well, if, but what about in this situation? If you see, you know, this is a reasonable uh, recommendation I think we can give to the board that shows that, you know, we're applying the law uh, as it is written and how it addresses essentially unique cases. That's what we get all the time. A lot of the issues that we resolve uh, are giving advice. Uh, and, and in fact, people who ask for our advice are often protected, uh, at least in the campaign finance, ethics, and lobbying area, when they rely on that advice as long as they give us the same facts uh, in that process. That, that there's an encouragement to do that. Um, and, you know, as we implement, whether it's the photo ID law or we had the same issue with the impartial justice law where there were a lot of unanswered questions. How do you lay out the time frames for contributions and things where the statutes were, you know, and we put together directions and we could have been, at, you know, hauled in to explain those as well. And I think we would have been in that position to do that and say, given what you told us, this is, this is the best advice we can give. And um, as I said, anytime you have lawyers at this, it's... You know, it's the old adage that uh, one lawyer will starve and two will fare very well because they can drum up that kind of uh, differences. And I think, you know, you saw that here on the committee with people uh, questioning interpretations either by committee members or by us. So is this the first time that this would happen? Well, I, I'm not sure what you mean by this. this is the first time. Well, that you, you would change your recommendation based on what the legislative body. Well, I, I think we have uh, addressed a lot of policy issues over the years, both under the old elections board and the government accountability board, where we looked at, you know, we heard feedback either directly at our board meeting from legislators or we heard feedback, you know, um, we had the same situation, quite frankly, in the 80s on uh, putting our um, decisions on how to count valid signatures on recall petitions in place. Now, can a, can a digital form still be downloaded by a voter, printed off, filled out, signed and mailed in? They can get it through an email or download it off a website that's been legal? Is that going to continue to be legal? All of our forms are digital and are on our website and people download them, print them off and use them. So that's not a change at all in that's any not, policy? That's not that a change. Will, that used to be good and it's still going to be good? That's right. Thank you. Just a matter of a single signature. Um, question. There were questions.